So I did this talk back in, I think, October of last year. And I think I just got back from a seminar in Chicago for two full days, and there was a lot of technical information that I incorporated in that presentation that I'm leaving out this time because it just it gets very messy. And the bottom line is it doesn't provide a whole heck of a lot of value anyways. So, um, so with that, I'm just going to kind of go through the material. If there's questions, stop me at any time because I've got um, probably close to 75 slides. <laughs> There's still a lot of information, a lot of material to go through. It's sometimes hard to weed out what's, I think, really important, what's not. Um, and so we can spend as little or more, you know, more time on certain topics, you know, as you guys see fit. So um, I always put my medical disclaimer in here because I do talk very passionately about all the vitamins and nutrition that I do here. So I've got to watch myself and be careful. Um, so don't take what I say and stop taking all of your prescription medication <laughs> and say, well, Dan at MD told me this and this and this. And so I'm not telling you that. I, I always recommend talking to your doctor first and foremost about any kind of changes in your medical therapy. You can certainly ask me questions about pharmaceuticals. Obviously, that's my background as a pharmacist, so I can advise you on those types of things on a more individual basis. Um, so just he heed that in mind. Um, so that is that. Um, but with that, I am working for you. So you've attended, you've paid big money to be here. <laughs> um, and so if there are questions in the future and you just want to bounce something off of me, call me. You know I'm here every day. Um, if I'm not here, um, Jenny, Kelly, the front end staff, they'll be able to take a message just as well as any, any reception out there and they'll get that message to me. I'll also include my email uh, on the last slide. So you can always email me. It's obviously a quick and easy way to get questions answered uh, in a proficient time. Um, kind of went through all this. I'm jumping ahead already. Um, so what pharmacist has your best interest? Hopefully at the end of this presentation, you're going to say me. <laughs> so um, that's my goal um, in the next hour, hour and a half that we have to uh, convince you of that. Um, so I'm part of your medical team now. So ask me questions, um, obviously, throughout the presentation. At the end of the, at the presentation, again, email me, get a hold of me, however you want to. And I'll be, do the best I can to get those questions for you answered. So a quick discussion on time. Why is, what does this have to do anything with the immune system? Um, and that is simply this. It's our most valuable asset. Um, we're limited amount, amount of time that we have here, right? So at some point, somebody flips over the hourglass or the week's glass or the year glass and time starts running out. So what I want to try to do tonight is obviously appreciate everyone's time here, get through the material as best we can, um, but I want to make the most of your time here and hopefully extend that in good health and a good immune system. So hopefully we can kind of cheat the system and buy more good quality of time, good quality of life. Um, four things we already know about time. I always kind of like um, pointing this out. Um, Investing in time over time is cumulative. These are all things we know, right? So a good example is exercising and eating right. We know that if we eat right every day, we might cheat once in a while. We might not exercise one morning or this or that. But if we continue to do something, even in small increments, obviously it's going to accumulate and we're going to um, capitalize on that. Converse is true, though, right? Neg being negligent you know, or neglecting something uh, is also cumulative. So not exercising every day, you know, that's going to build up and lead to poor health. So um, those things we already know. Not investing in your health. Random uses of time has no cumulative value. So if we exercise once a week or once every other week or maybe we eat right here and there, that's not going to add up to anything. You know, I'm going to say, is that going to help my immune system? I'm going to tell you it's not <laughs> for the most part. Um, and you can't make up for misspent time. So hopefully by the end of this seminar, we're all going to be motivated to spend more time on our health so that we hopefully can get more of the most valuable asset that I think we all have, isn't it? And that is our time. So I'm going to get back to this, just kind of keep this picture in the back of your mind. Um, I'm not going to tell you who this is quite yet. Um, obviously, you can kind of see from the picture a little child that's not doing so well. Um, probably in a hospital. So 
we're going to kind of keep that in the back of our mind. What is a child, you know, at a young stage of life, what is their immune system going through? How does it adapt to change? Um, you know, how does it fight off the big measles outbreaks, those kind of things, chicken pox, simple flu. Um, what's going on in that picture? So I'm going to go through these 10 core principles for improving immune function. So these are kind of those take-home points of those of you that just, you know what, what do I need to know overall that's going to improve my immune system? I think we could summarize it in 10 points. We could probably argue a few of these. Um, but maintaining and um, using protective barriers, so our skin, or our GI tract. And I'm going to go in through, through these in quite, quite detail. Um, creating commensal friendly environments, so using probiotics. Having good hygiene. Uh, avoiding antigens and allergens in adulthood. Uh, building a micronutrient and antioxidant reserve. So that one seems a little bit even more obscure to me. What does that actually mean? We'll kind of tease that one apart. Build and maintain um, cellular energy. Maintain adequate detox capacity. We're not going to go a lot into that tonight. I actually took my slides out on that because it, it was just getting too long and too cumbersome. And I've done talks on detox on, for just one to two hours at a time just with detoxifying the body. Um, it is important and I'm not going to stress it too much tonight. I think there's more important things uh, to focus on in this talk that are going to have a better, um, a significant impact on the immune system. Um, reduce stress, uh, reduce cortisol induced immune suppression. I think that's a big one in our environment. We're constantly under stress for a multitude of reasons. We'll go through that. Um, reduce chronic inflammation, uh, or I'm sorry, re reduce chronic inflammatory triggers and mediators. And where's my last one? Use appropriate immune modulators to create balance and strengthen your immune system. So we'll look at those two, we'll tease that apart. So we're gonna jump into the barriers of, of the immune system. So there's, there's two main components. There's the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, which is our lungs, um, genitourinary tract, respiratory tract. These are all our called mucous membrane areas. Um, so that's one area where there's an opportunity for infection to get in. Um, you know, who hasn't had an upper respiratory infection or let's just say even say a yeast infection, uh, sinus infection. I think we're all aware of those types of things. So and those bacteria and viruses that are getting into those mucosal areas why are they getting in there in some, pa in some patients and others not? Um, what can we do to increase the integrity of that area? We'll look at that. Um, and then uh, we'll spend a significant amount of time on looking at um, the GI tract, so gut-associated lymphoid tissue. The big thing here that I want to point out is the majority of our immune system is really in that spot right there. It's right in our GI tract. It's, there's one layer of cells that separates our, uh, you know, our food, what's going on, what we're getting absorbed and into our bloodstream and there's a huge um, array and I don't, I'm not going into that tonight but all of the white blood cells and dendritic cells and natural killer cells and all of these different components of the immune system um, really lies in this area right here so we're going to be looking at a lot of that. Commensal friendly environment so what does that even mean? So we're talking about good bugs and bad bugs. It's probiotics so hopefully we've all heard that term probiotics, that's a good bacteria um, that is going to have a multitude of different benefits in, in our immune system and in other parts of our health. Um, so we're going to look at that. Um, here's a, just a common product that we sell here. There's a multitude of different probiotics out on the market, so I'm going to try to help distinguish which ones we should buy, which ones we should stay away from. Um, I heard this about this probiotic and this about that. Um, where do, I, where do I need to go with a probiotic? How much do I need to take? We'll go through that as well. I'm not going to spend a lot on hygiene, um, but we do know that having clean water, having a sewer system now, that all helps with our immune system. Um, a lot of individuals that are sick, we can probably make an argument for a lot of these children that are, you know, these child care centers and so forth that are, these kids that are breaking out with these measles um, issues right now, we could you know, make an argument that, well, maybe we should quarantine those, those patients off to some extent so it doesn't keep the spreading and spreading and becoming more of an issue. When I did this talk back in October, it was the whole um, Ebola outbreak and quarantine those in individuals and, um, you know, we need to do something with that potentially. Um, and then a big thing, a big debate um, 
you know, in my world is, is looking at the overuse of antibiotics. So are we an over sanitized society? So I've got the um, hand sanitizer right up by the counter. You know, is that really necessary? Um, you know, we could argue, you know, both sides of that, I'm sure, you know, on end. Um, but, you know, is that really important? Are we getting rid of um, all of the bacteria on our hands and now we've got some, some bacteria that survive that and now we create these superbugs that we hear of, you know, and then antibiotics aren't working against these bacteria. So and we have to think about all of those things and kind of question those. You know, when is it appropriate to use those hand sanitizers? Avoiding antigens and allergens as we age. So um, what I'm talking about there, as we age, our immune system becomes more susceptible to things that maybe weren't a problem um, in the past. So, you know, as we age, we tend to develop more of a sensitivity to dairy. You know, we're lactose intolerant, where before we could have that, that food item, and now we're not. So what's going on there? So we'll kind of uh, peel that apart. <clears throat> um, inflammation becomes more chronic. So as we age, generally speaking, and hopefully we can halt some of these things in ourselves by the end of tonight, is getting rid of this chronic inflammation. And there's almost every disease state out there can be related to some inflammatory uh, mediator. So in some regards, you know, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, arthritis, um, we can uh, contribute a lot of those major medical conditions out there to some type of inflammation in the, in the, in the body somewhere. Um, so how can, we, how can we address that? Um, and then malignantly formed or transformed cells evade watchful eyes of our body surveillance. So what I'm talking about there is basically cancer. So we've got cells that, you know, for whatever reason, they get copied wrong. And so now we've got this strange cell that just wants to keep dividing and dividing and dividing. Basically, that's, that's cancer right there. Well, we all have cancer at some point. Cancer basically is just another illness in the body. It's really just another chronic condition. Um, and typically, our immune system will, should take care of that. But why is it not? Why are, we, why are we losing the battle on cancer? In my opinion, I think we are. Um, and if you've seen other seminars here, there's other doctors in the area that would, would, um, would agree with me on that. Um, so that's that. Um, building metabolic reserve. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that, but um, it's basically looking at somebody that's immunocompromised or just has an infection. What does it really take to get their immune system back up and running at 100%? You know, is it just, you know, you take a multivitamin, and it's got 100% of all your daily allowances, is that enough? I would argue it's not. You know, it's not going to get, a, you know, we take 100% of vitamin C. I don't even know what that number is. I think it's 150 milligrams, something like that, maybe 300 milligrams. Is that really enough vitamin C to, to boost our immune system to the level that it really needs to be at? I would argue it's not. Um, so we're looking at building mitochondrial energy, and we'll look into that a little deeper. We'll I'm avoiding the detox talk tonight, but that is going to be important. Um, so let me jump to the next slide. Um, cortisol control. Um, cortisol is our stress hormone. So as our stress level rises, our cortisol, which is a hormone, rises with that. And it's important. It helps us manage that stress. But in our day and age, our cortisol level, that hormone level, continues to rise and rise and rise, and that just wreaks havoc on the immune system for a multitude of reasons we'll go into. Um, but we need to somehow figure out how to manage our stress more effectively so that our cortisol levels come back down within range so that our immune system doesn't get beat up. Uh, and reducing chronic inflammation. So and that kind of goes hand in hand with um, a multitude of different things, but there's inflammation all over. So what, what do we need to do to um, lower that in our body? Um, so the issue with um, inflammation is that it's not all bad. It, that inflammatory, those inflammatory mediators, so is in, inflammation due to allergies, some of those things are important, but we want to make sure that they're not overstepping their bounds. I mentioned that already, but chronic, chronic inflammation is almost part of every, every disease out there. So just kind of keep that in mind as well, too. Um, 
So just, the, I, I like putting in these lifestyle principles. Our, our bodies were designed with a multitude of similar buffering mechanisms that allow the body to have amazing resilience against poor lifestyle decisions. Every lifestyle decision either weakens or strengthens its capacity. Over time of months, years, decades, both good and bad decisions have a cumulative effect on our body's ability uh, to create health. So again, kind of tying that back in with making the most valuable use of our time. We want to make those just small deposits every day on our health. Um, and really that's going to, I think, have the most profound effect on our immune system. So what are, you know, what are those little things that we can do? Um, so I'm going to go through this, each one of these steps now, just in a little bit more detail and kind of break this apart even further. Come on in. <laughs> There's a few chairs sprinkled around. <laughs> it's a common problem. <laughs> so the GI tract really is the largest interface with the external environment. What I mean by that is um, I really think of as foods get swallowed into our esophagus, into our stomach, I really think of that as, as still the external environment. It's not interacting directly with our bloodstream. Um, all therapies involving foods, beverages, supplements, drugs um, require a predictable interface with the GI system and related detox pathways. And what I really mean by that is anything that we basically, you know, swallow, put down our mouths, we got to figure out, is that a healthy thing to do? Is that a wise thing to do? Should I really be consuming that? How is that interacting with, with my GI tract? Is that going to have a positive effect, a negative effect? Is it not going to really do anything at all? If it does get absorbed, Am I going to be able to get rid of it appropriately? Um, and a big thing that we deal with here at the pharmacy is, is bioidentical hormones. A lot of the hormones are, are delivered uh, through capsule. We're taking estrogen, we're taking progesterone, we're taking thyroid. That has to get through our GI tract and then somehow get into our bloodstream and so forth and, and make changes. You know, is that really the best thing to do? All those hormones are getting taken up in the bloodstream, through the stomach, through the intestines, and then they have to go through the liver and get metabolized. Is that affecting the integrity of the GI tract at that point? Some, th some of those things we just don't have the answers to it yet, but we, we got to be thinking about those things. Um, and this is only one, and I'll show this in the next slide or two, but that barrier, that, that, that layer of cells that I'm talking about is one cell layer thick. It is a very tiny interface. Um, so we can think of it that way. It's just very easy to have a breakdown in that barrier, and we're going to have things getting through, antigens getting through, that are going to have a, a profound impact, negative impact on our immune system. <clears throat> so what I really want to do with the GI tract, there's four things. I want to remove allergens, so if we're allergic to soy, if we're allergic to lactose, gluten is a big one right now. Whatever those are, we need to get rid of them. That's going to continue to have a negative impact and start weaning down and, and breaking down those, those cells that are just one layer thick. Um, toxins, har harmful organisms, <clears throat> got to get rid of all of that as much as we can. And then once we've removed all the bad things, we want to put good things in place, which are those probiotics. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, Re-inoculate with probiotics. And then we want to do a repair process. So if we've damaged our our GI tract enough and there's maybe we have a GI ulcer, maybe we have some kind of colitis or inflammatory bowel issue, there's some kind of inflammatory chronic condition in our in our intestines. Um, we need to we need ways to repair that and patch it, patch things back up. So what what's the best way to do that? <clears throat> Is it a proton pump inhibitor? Answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> So I, just to kind of get us all on the same page, you know, we've got, I'm, I'm talking about um, VLI, micro VLI. It's basically all these little tiny folds in our intestines. We've got, you know, th three foot long tube of this basically, right? Um, but then there's all these very tiny intricate folds. And we're getting into basically down to the, again, one cellular level of, of where this interface is between what the external environment is, which I'm considering what our food is, what's our intestines, and then on the other side of that, our internal environment, which is our, our bloodstream. Um, and there's a whole complex, uh-oh. Oh, um, um, interface there that we have to, that the body has to kind of figure out and sort through. 
Um, I'm not going to go into all the biophysiology in, on this slide. Um, it, it would take me all day to probably explain it anyways. Um, but there's a multitude of different things going on. The important thing that I always like to point out with this slide is with this one layer of cells that are here between the external environment out here and what I'll just call this inside here in our bloodstream where our, our white blood cells are, is that there's different molecules in here that really clog up and protect different toxins from getting down into our bloodstream. We want to make sure those stay in place. And if they do get dislodged or dismembered or what and so forth, like this picture down here, um, there's an autoimmune issue going on with this, this person's uh, GI tract. How do we rebuild this? Is there any way to put back the pieces and, and get that functioning the way that it should? And, and, and there are, so um, we just need to kind of peel that up apart and, and look at that closely. Um, and with, you know, so I, I always pose the question, what is leaky gut? We always hear about this. Our you know, intestines are breaking down. There's different things getting through our our GI tract that, that are causing an immune reaction. Um, you know, how, can we, how can we fix that? Um, so I kind of went through all this already, but um, this, this glue kind of holds these cells together. And what happens is there's this uh, particular cell called a dendritic cell that is kind of a surveillance cell. It, it kind of sticks its arm. Let me go back here for a second. Um, through a couple of these cells and it kind of monitors the environment, it monitors our food and it kind of gives the immune system down here an idea of, you know, is it very toxic out here? Is there a big war? Is there a big, uh, um, you know, allergens that are coming through that you know, we got to be careful and tighten things up? Um, those cells play an important part of kind of allowing things to go, you know, back and forth um, between those two. Skip that. Uh, so what causes this breakdown of this, of this junction between these cells? There's a multitude of different things. Um, what I mean by dysbiosis is just an imbalance of, of good bacteria in the GI tract. And we'll talk about how to fix that. Um, a big thing that I focus on is medication. So uh, what I mean by steroids, a classic example would be prednisone. So anyone that's typically on an autoimmune issue, um, Chronic inflammation, you can be on prednisone for a multitude of different things um, that can really wreak havoc on the, the GI tract. Um, antacids, uh, proton pump inhibitors, um, anti-inflammatory drugs, those can all lead to uh, weakening of the intestinal lining, which is ultimately going to lead to a leaky gut syndrome. PPI uh, is proton pump inhibitor, so it's an... It's an Antacid, um, an example would be like a Nexium or a Prilosect or a Protonix. It's, it's typically used for heartburn symptoms or some type of indigestion issues. So, um, alcohol can, can um, slowly erode that layer of cells. Antibiotics, uh, stress can do this, and we'll get to that. Uh, acute trauma, toxins, infections, so there's a multitude of different things that really are wreaking havoc on that, just again, that one layer of cells. I have a question. Yep. With the prednisone and mm -hmm. the other steroids, um, does it have to be over like a long period of time or? It doesn't have to be even, dosing. it could be, I mean, I've had experience with patients here that they'll be on prednisone for two weeks and, and come up with issues, um, pretty profound issues. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a very long time, especially if you're, you know, you're, you're compromising your immune system in other parts too. It doesn't take much for that, those forces to break down and something slides through, through the GI tract. Are you talking to doctors? What? Are you talking to Western medicine doctors about this? Because they're the ones that are prescribing it. And I understand for to combat something else, mm -hmm. but the side effect is right. not good. No, and it has a long-term implication. Okay. Yep. Th this is just uh, an article that I came across that um, had an association with leaky gut and autoimmune disease. So, the again, the more the holes that are poked through that layer of cells through the in intestinal lumen, uh, there's more of a, there's a greater risk of acquiring autoimmune conditions. Uh, 
All right, so what can we do to fix this issue? So there's a, um, my favorite product for this is something called Inflamacore. Um, that should be on your sheets somewhere. Let me take a look. Oh. <coughs> Oh, maybe not. Oh, well, you have one. There's not. I don't think everyone has that sheet. No, I've got. I've got a. I'm gonna just hold, hold this. Up. Can you get more of this? This is the sheet. I'm gonna get everyone a copy of this. But um, Inflamacore's on there. Um, it's a multitude of different products in a powder that. Um, Basically, again, it can increases the integrity of the, of the immune system. Or, I'm sorry, of the intestinal lining, which then will increase the integrity of the immune system. I think Jenny's going to hand out some of those. And she'll make copies. You get, do we have a bunch of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Is there anyone that doesn't have a list of supplements? Oh, there's a bunch. Oh, boy. So I'm not going to go through each one of these individually, but um, let me see here. But there's curcumin, skull cap, green tea, uh, vitamin D, glutamine, glycine um, that are just critical for increasing the integrity of that layer of cells. So I'll get those rest up. <laughs> oh, we'll get a few more. <laughs> um, so I'm a I'm a huge fan of that product. Um, basically, my recommendation is one scoop a day. Um, I would do that as more of a maintenance dose. Um, on the packaging, it talks about two scoops a day. I would normally do that for somebody with a very acute issue. So a lot of chronic inflammation, you have acute distress. Um, I would do two scoops a day. Generally speaking, what I've seen when using this product, though, is patients will end up with diarrhea. My suspicion is, though, that there's a lot of toxins, there's a lot of dysbiosis going on in the GI tract, and now we've increased the integrity of the intestinal wall, or the, the lumen. And so the, the, the body's kind of figured out there's a lot of garbage in our intestines, <laughs> so it's all going to get shot out. <laughs> so they, it's obviously they're not expecting that. It's not very pleasant. I probably didn't do a good job warning them. Um, so I'm warning you all now. This does work. I mean, that's that's actually a good side effect, in my opinion, getting rid of some of those things. Mm -hmm. And my celiac protein, CRP level came back. Mm -hmm. 2.5. And it's my understanding anything over one is an indicator of inflammation. And five is pretty bad. Does, am, I t am I understanding that to be right? 2.5. I don't know the exact number. I kind of base see what the reference range is for each lab. That's what but I Mm -hmm. But aside from products containing supplements and nutrients to reduce inflammation, can the baby aspirin work? Does magnesium work? Mm -hmm. Vitamin C at 2,000 milligrams a day? I mean, might I already have everything I need besides me to buy a supplement like that? Is there another approach? Uh, there's going to be a m multitude of approaches. This is just happens to be the approach I, I'm recommending. I yeah, I generally wouldn't. Baby aspirin is a, obviously we all know is an anti-inflammatory, but I don't think it's the best choice. I, unless you've got some other predisposition. If you've had a previous heart attack, then I'm going to say yes to that. Well, but right but if it's, I could I could see that to be effective. But I would say with Reynolds, I would look at. I would, yeah, obviously with a C-reactive protein of two and a half, let's just, let's just say any elevated C-reactive protein level, regardless of kind of the number, you want to get that down below one it is yeah. tip generally in my mind what I'm trying to shoot for. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, and so let's see here. Um, so for the, my next product for this is glutag uh, glutagenics. I've talked about this in a multitude of different seminars I've put on. Um, Glutagenics is, is three basic things. Um, it's, um, it's glutamine or L-glutamine, and I'll get to that um, 
later on as well too. Aloe vera and deglycinated licorice root. So all of those three ingredients are just um, soft tissue healers essentially. Um, and it just, it, it works wonders. I absolutely love it. You do have to dose it more frequently. It's three to four times per day. It's, um, it comes in a powdered form, so it's not very user friendly. Um, you mix it up with about a half a glass of water, drink that three to four times a day. Um, and that has a, has a really nice effect on increasing that, that barrier function. Um, and then probiotics, I'll talk about that in just a minute. And uh, glucosamine for the GI tract. Never thought about that. I always thought of glucosamine for, for joint tissue, um, but it actually is a great way uh, to increase mucin and mucus production. So if we, a lot of times there might be an excess of mucus production in the GI tract, but there are patients that suffer with not enough. And then again, it basically gets, I kind of call it like a dry colon, so to speak, where then you, the opportunistic infections have an easier chance getting through because the, the mucus isn't there to kind of slow them down and catch them. I'm going to kind of delve into, yeah, to friendly bugs. I don't know if those are good bugs or bad bugs, but I <laughs> thought the imagery was kind of nice. Um, so I touched on this already. Again, dysbiosis is basically this you know, definition of an imbalance of uh, microbial environment in the gut due to overgrowth of harmful organisms, you know, overgrowth of bad bacteria, yeast, parasites, etc. Um, or I should say that uh, the depletion of helpful commensal organisms, you know, bugs that should be there that, that just aren't. Um, the key point with uh, microbial rebalancing is that um, probiotics are not recolonizing the gut, but typically only survive for, for two weeks in the GI tract. So patients ask me a lot of questions on probiotics. How long do I have to take them? When should I take them? So on and so forth. Probiotics are really just going to be there to reset the stage. Uh, for your, your natural flora to come back and flourish in the GI tract, and then those, those probiotics are just going to kind of die off and move on on their own. So they're not going to hang out for a very long time. So there are some cases where if there's Crohn's or IBS or some kind of chronic inflammation of the GI tract or celiac, um, you probably would want to take those probiotics almost on an every other day basis. Um, when we're eating the meats of animals that are Mm -hmm. Is this an issue uh, and a reason to also take probiotics? You could argue that. I, I mean, um, yeah, hard to say. I, I would say if it's problematic for the patient, then I would take them, take them at least every other day. So, yep. um, um, so there is just a huge amount of bacteria in the GI tract. Typically not, no. I mean, ideally, in the ideal scenario, whatever that chronic inflammation is that's going on, you're going to take it for that period of time. And hopefully then we can clear, and again, we can, it might take a month, it take make six months or a year. Generally speaking, I don't typically recommend probiotics all the time, every single day. I might cycle them, um, and then if you're eating a lot of, um, meat or animal products with antibiotics in them, then you could probably make the argument that you should, you know, take them on a more cyclical basis. But generally speaking, I'm not <coughs> popping in a probiotic every single day of the year. Yeah. I just think it's there's better use elsewhere with with the funds. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's it's just a phenomenal amount of bacteria that are in there. No, it's okay. I just wanted to ask you, if you've got a problem with milk mm -hmm. and we're into lactobacillus origin, whatever, what do you do? I mean, are there probiotics that don't have lactobacillus? The, I mean, there's fermented foods. We could do that, but that's not going to give us a lot of bac uh, bacteria. There, Metagenics does make a dairy-free um, probiotic. I don't normally carry it. It's not a big mover here, but I can certainly order it in. But they do make... Uh, a dairy-free probiotic. Yeah, so that's a good question. Because most probiotics are basically grown in a broth containing some type of dairy product. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's skip over that. 
got a, got a lot to cover yet. <laughs> There's a lot of research on probiotics as well, too, so I'm not I'm going to skip over some of these slides. Um, I'm going to skip over that, too, and that. Um, so with probiotics, we're, we're really talking about a re-inoculation type of effect. Um, so commercially prepared pro probiotics generally have, again, a two to three week residency stay in the GI tract. Probiotics rarely multiply in the GI tract. So you do have to take a big dose of these probiotics. They're not just going to grow and flourish on their own when you take the probiotic. You're going to take these bugs. They're kind of, they're going to come back to life, basically. Um, do what they need to do, form these biofilms, kind of form these uh, little microcultures in the GI tract, push out the bad bacteria. Your, your natural flora is going to grow and flourish, and then those good bugs that have kind of set up shop and have created this environment are going to move on as well, too. They're not going to sit there and, you know, reproduce on their own. Um, the key with probiotics is you want biodiversity and balance. What I mean by that is when you look at a probiotic, you want to make sure there's multiple strains in the probiotic. You don't, you don't want to take a probiotic that, that just has one or two strains, typically speaking. Um, Florigen would be the exception of that. No, I'm not going to really get into that. But there are certain situations where a probiotic, you might just want to take one or two strains or maybe three strains. But for a very uh, inf inf inflamed issue or complicated issue where there's um, a lot of inflammation, the immune system is, is very much broken down, you're going to want multiple species in that probiotic, multiple strains in that probiotic. Uh, when you're looking at probiotics, you want to make sure that they're stable. So when you look at the label, you want to see if that 20 billion or 50 billion or 100 billion uh, units of culture are are viable at the time of expiration. I think that's an important part. A lot of manufacturers of probiotics will put a number of 20 billion or 50 billion on the label, but if you call that company, they can only really prove that at the time of manufacture, unless they've done their research and their testing. Um, you want to make sure that, that that what's on the label is actually being uh, proven to you as a consumer that you're, you're going to be guaranteed those numbers of, of CFUs, they would call them colony forming units, units at the time of expiration. Um, you want to select strains that are able to withstand freeze drying, and most of them are uh, at this point. Um, it's formu formulated to meet label claim at the time of expiration. Um, and the thing about refrigeration is um, you can refrigerate anything that's basically unopened, but once you, uh, especially with orthobiotic, which I recommend taking, I think that's, I hope everyone has that list now um, for barrier functions, but orthobiotic should be on there. Um, once you open that product, you want to keep it at room temperature. Um, going in and out of the refrigerator is going to create moisture and condensation on the capsules, and that's actually going to uh, speed up the decay of those probiotics in that product. Is that any one of the probiotics that say that it should be refrigerated? The, uh, probiotics, probiotics that... Um, are, are recommended at room temperature, that's what that would apply for. If they're at room temperature, then I would keep them at room temperature. Then they've gone through a, a freeze-drying process where they, they're stable at room temperature. But if it's, if it's okay, it should be then always refrigerate it. So like Florigen would be an example of that. They don't have um, a particular freeze-drying process that enables them, to, enables them to be stored at room temperature. So Florigen I would always keep refrigerated. So that one, it, that Florigen product is going to break down quicker um, if you keep taking it out of the fridge and leaving it, leaving it out and then putting it back in and so forth. So if you buy it and it's refrigerated, keep it that way. One isn't better than the other, whether it's refrigerated or not. It's just a matter of, you know, I, the, the issue for me is when it's the, f the probiotic is refrigerated, you're less likely to take it because you're going to forget about it being in the fridge. That's really... Yeah. But yeah. So. Well, most of the time I would, would take it, but sometimes, you know, I wouldn't, and then but now I've made a list now. Okay, we're going to make a list. It's like it one yeah. ingredient and it's not working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that helps a lot. Yeah. That's the, that's the only reason I like ortho, well, one of the reasons I like orthobiotic is because once you get it home and you start taking it, it goes right in your pillbox or, your, or wherever you take store all your vitamins. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I thought it said on a bottle that I, I have is uh, refrigerate after opening. So Not on orthobiotic. 
Mm -mm. Some other some other probiotics maybe, but um, if it's like an orthobiotic, I know for sure keep it at room temp. But can you yeah. get that in, in fifty billion or higher? Orthobiotic because it. Um, Yes and no. You, they make a, something called probiotic uh, 225, which is 225 billion cultures, which is the equivalency of, what, 20 orthobiotic capsules. Mm -hmm. so, you can, so you you can do something like that if you need more. Yeah. There are other probiotics that offer like the 50 billion or 100 billion. Um, so, but Again, that's just going to be individually based, I would say. I would say generally, as a general recommendation for immune health, for increasing the barrier of the uh, intestinal wall, a, a 20 billion culture with seven strains so would be. Uh, then I. Mm Then I would take, yeah, if he told you to take 50 billion, then I would. And I would make sure that whatever product that is, is that it's 50 billion, guaranteed 50 billion at the time of the expiration, not the time that they made it. That's always a big trick. Yeah. And you should be able to call the, call the company that made it and ask them that. You know, show me the proof that it's there. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so taking with or without food, I always get this question of when should I take the probiotic? Um, you know, is it 30 minutes before food? Is it during the meal? Is it 30 minutes after? Um, there was a study that looked at this. Essentially, the results said um, 30 minutes before a meal had a slightly higher survival rates of the, pro of the bacteria we're talking about versus with food or 30 minutes after a meal. Um, this was basically clinically insignificant. So I always say if you're going to take a probiotic, just take it. If you're, you're eating already, you're like, oh, my God, I forgot, to, you know, if I have to take my probiotic, just take the darn thing. It's better to take it than not. Um, I kind of touched on this already. What, what probiotic is right for me? Again, that is going to vary patient to patient, but generally speaking, a probiotic, you want it to be multi-strain. For adults, again, general recommendations here, 20 to 40 billion uh, per day. And then for children, about one to five billion CFUs per day. Um, again, I should probably ch I should probably change this. Um, I typically recommend every other day dosing with a probiotic. You get just as much benefit um, with every other day dosing. You can stretch your dollar twice as far, and again, gain gain almost exactly the same benefit. Uh, so avoiding antigens and allergens. Um, I don't know, has anyone had skin testing done for allergens? So if, if, was it something similar to that? Yeah. Yeah. On your back, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so it's, you know, it, once we identify, you know, what your allergens are, obviously then you want to stay away from them. Um, and so, um, you know, Sometimes we just don't know what we're allergic to. Our immune system is triggering an, a reaction and it thinks that it's a virus or something, you know, that's damaging to our bodies and it's overreacting, and it, you know, it's eggs, you know, it's, and it, it could be damaging to that patient, obviously, if they're reacting to it. Um, but obviously the immune system has gone haywire. It's, it's reacting to something that generally is not going to cause damage to our body. The, the quick and easy way for that is avoid it for two weeks completely, 100%, and then see if you feel better. And I would say, because it, it really doesn't, you could, I just would tell patients to save the money. I mean, you can go and get the test done for gluten sensitivity, and, and I don't know the exact numbers of how specific it is or how sensitive it is. Um, but what we do know is if we stop all gluten sources for two weeks and we feel better, well, then we know we're sensitive to, you know, our, per, our body is sensitive to some level, so why go back on it? I, that's what I did for myself, and my joints felt much, much more, like, just flexible, essentially. So, yeah. Some people just have to know if they're gluten-sensitive. I just, 
just you know, it costs you nothing to you know, a little time and effort to just not take any gluten for two two weeks, and then you know, so who cares what the test? <laughs> um, uh, foods, drugs that alter commensal bacteria. We kind of touched on that. Avoid foods that pr uh, promote an inflammatory environment. So whatever those are for the person, uh, obviously you don't want to keep taking those in. Um, some of those foods that you're sensitive to. You, you know, you probably could make the argument if you increase the integrity of the intestinal lumen and you, you know, rebuild up the walls, so to speak, in your intestines, you might be able to reinduce some of those foods again. Because in theory, some of those proteins or whatever those peptides are that are getting through that are causing that immune reaction, hopefully you've built up the defenses again that they aren't going to continue to leak through your gut. Uh, foods to avoid. Can anybody tell me what that is? Things, it looks like honey, but it's actually high fructose corn syrup. Honey wouldn't be a bad thing for the immune system. Yeah, Trick question. So that's high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> so that will wreck the immune system. So high fructose corn syrup <laughs> generally takes, wipes out about half of your blood, white blood cells in your bloodstream at any one moment in time. Uh, so foods to avoid for the immune so high, So sugar. Sugar wreaks havoc on the immune system. The higher our blood sugar gets, the lower our, immune, our ability to fight infection gets. Uh, high glycemic fruits, grains, gluten. So gluten is so genetically modified, that it actually raises your blood sugar faster than regular uh, white table sugar does now. So, <laughs> so that's horrendous. Many people will say, okay, well, it's natural sugar, you know, like <laughs> in a banana or whatever. Isn't that better than cane sugar? Uh, and I usually you can make that argument because it, be, it has to be broken down a little bit, right? There's fructose and yeah. whatever, glucose. Um, sucrose, um, so it's going to, and there's fiber with the, with the fr fruit, um, but generally speaking, high glycemic fruits still are not, uh, yeah, better than a Snickers or a Mountain Dew, but <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a better choice. It's a lesser of two evils. Um, I'll, let me do it this way. I'll tell you the fruit, the low glycemic fruits that I would, I would do. I would do apples, blueberries. Uh, ras yeah, raspberry. Well, not strawberries though. Those are high, a little bit higher glycemic. Um, so blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries. So four things. Yeah. So not pineapple, not banana. Not in large amounts. Yeah. Eating bananas got me off coast. Well, that would be. Then that's a good thing. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> Trading out. Trading out. So, but I would. I would generally say, not to consume those higher glycemic fruits. Yeah. Um, dairy, what else do we have in here? Soy, alcohol, which is basically sugar anyways. Uh, coffee, there's a lot of toxins in coffee. This is tea that I'm drinking, by the way. Uh, processed foods, for a multitude of reasons we're not going to get into, and canned foods. <laughs> so. So eating for your immune system. So we could, again, spend a uh, multitude of time on this too, but gluten-free diet, eating an anti-inflammatory -infl diet, low in sugar, um, high in essential fatty acids, so high in fish oil, um, eating plenty of cultured foods. We kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, it's not, you're not going to really, in my comparison, people always, you know, customers will ask me, well, can I just um, eat yogurt? Will I get enough probiotics that way? And Generally speaking, again, I'm just making generalities here, but you have to eat 10 cups of yogurt to equal the amount of bacteria in one probiotic capsule. So who's going to eat 10 cups of yogurt a day? Uh, I, might eat, I might eat two. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, ensure adequate protein, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin A. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Actually, we're going to get to it right now. Uh, so vitamin A, required for normal, innate, and adaptive immune cell function. So um, basically the, the innate system, I'm not going to get into this a lot, but it's kind of the uh, nonspecific part of the immune system where um, there's white blood cells, there's different players of, of this part of the immune system that kind of attacks anything and everything. It doesn't really, dis it knows something's bad, so it's going to go after it. So vitamin A will help in that capacity. Um, but vitamin A also helps with the adaptive immune cell function. So the part of our immune system, when we get a cold or a virus or an infection, and then we get that same infection 
a month later, we have a mounted immune response. Or there's certain cells in our immune system that have memory. They say, I've seen that virus before. I know exactly how to tear that thing apart. So vitamin A will help enhance that component of the immune system as well, too. How many milligrams did you have on that? Uh, I think that's on a slide coming up. <laughs> um, I kind of touched on that. That's just talking more in depth about that. Um, also improves production of IgA, um, which is IgA is important for the adaptive or the learned immune system. Uh, zinc, uh, important for the growth and development of m immune cells. Uh, deficiency impairs both, again, this innate and acquired immune systems. Um, the caution with zinc is you always want to make sure you're balancing that out with copper. Um, so you don't want to just go out and take a ton of zinc. Um, 15 milligrams maybe at the most general recommendation for men you could probably get away with 30 milligrams a day vitamin D we could spend a whole hour on that but essentially with vitamin D you want to I always say with vitamin D is test your level and then get your level up between I would say be, you can debate the numbers 50 to 90 60 to 100 somewhere in that range depends who you talk to um, not 30, not 40. I think that's too low. You could probably make an argument for 50. Um, with vitamin D, I, I kind of like to fill the bucket up, so to speak, with my vitamin D. I try to get into that 80, 90 range. And again, that not, might not be appropriate for everyone, um, but vitamin D has a profound impact on the immune system and other systems in the body as well. Um, vitamin D and, and autoimmunity. So um, looking at autoimmune diseases and conditions, there is a, there's a high correlation with if you have a low vitamin D level, you have a higher risk of an autoimmune condition. So vitamin D does affect or can have a positive influence on getting rid of like Hashimoto's, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and, and the list can go on. I'm kind of speeding up here because I see I'm almost an hour into this. Um, so talking about mitochondrial energy, um, so this is what we're talking about. We have a cell of our body, the nucleus, all the DNA here. Um, what I'm talking about with mitochondria or metabolic reserve are these little guys right here, these little organelles um, that produce all of the energy in our cells, all the energy in our body. Those are mitochondria. These, uh, these little kidney-shaped guys here, yeah. They take in glucose make ATP um, and all kinds of magic basically happens. But what we want those little guys to do, what we want the mitochondria to do is have just a plethora of nutrients laying around that they can burn up sugar, produce energy, um, and so that when our immune system gets attacked, we just have a full tank of gas ready to go at any time to produce white blood cells, to increase, you know, increase the integrity of our skin and increase the integrity of the intestinal lumen and so on and so forth. Um, so what do those little guys need to, to run? Um, they need the right amount of protein. They need omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, I say few simple sugars, so they don't need a Mountain Dew, but they might need uh, some blueberries, some blackberries to get going. Um, adequate micronutrient reserve, I was going to talk about that. Um, antioxidants, selenium, vitamin A, vitamin E, uh, a little bit of vitamin C. That's what they're looking for. Um, so this is a short list of just supplements that, again, help with this. So DHA is just an omega-3 fatty acid. I'm not going to get into some of these hormones today, but DHEA can be very helpful for building metabolic reserve. Pregnenolone, which is another hormone. Um, adaptogenic herbs. Um, my favorite adaptogenic herb is ashwagandha. I'll get into that in just a little bit about managing stress. Um, um, ashwagandha does a good job at helping control cortisol levels in the body. Um, insulin sensitizers, I'm not going to go a lot into this tonight, but lipoic acid, uh, chromium, berberine fiber, I think that is on your handout um, somewhere, hopefully, one of your lists. Yeah, mitochondria, yeah, metabolic reserve, so there should be a list there of those nutrients. So for patients that um, are having troubles with balancing sugar, maybe they're diabetic, you know, they're just, their sugars are always running very high, um, I'd want them to focus on these insulin uh, sensitizers. 
um, and then lifestyle related changes in the I say in the perception of stressful events so one person can have a stress you know we can have the same the same event happen in two different you know one person their cortisol level goes through the roof and the other it's, it stays right where it should be so you know, there's different things we can do just in our lifestyle to change the perception of, you know, is that really a catastrophe that I need to freak out about or not? So um, just different things like that can help. It doesn't burn up our reserve. Um, this is just a short list of, um, I say, primary products for mitochondria. So acetyl L-carnitine, um, and I'll show a product in just a minute, acetyl um, N-acetylcysteine, alpha-lipoic acid, and then there's some secondary um, nutrients as well. They're basically all wrapped up into mitochore. Um, so that's a really quick and easy product. So if somebody has, uh, there's a lot of mitochondrial uh, dysfunctions that um, Children's Hospital sees and Freighter Hospital sees. I, I'm seeing more of this where you know, my, my child has mitochondrial dysfunction. They need exorbitant amounts of CoQ10 and different nutrients like acetyl L-carnitine, um, this would be a great product for that type of individual. Um, the other place where this soars um, is um, in patients with HIV. In that particular, so that's an immune system that's completely compromised. Um, there's certain blood cells that that virus actually attacks that are integral for the immune system. Um, and what happens is the medications that are used to treat that virus basically destroy the mitochondria in the cell, just literally just wipe them out. And so there's a doctor, Dr. John Kaiser, he's down, I believe, and I can't remember where exactly where he's at in the United States. I want to say Texas, but I don't think that's right. Um, but he helped develop this product, and he actually took patients off of their antiretroviral medications, able to put them on this product, and they're able to keep their immune systems fully functioning. It was phenomenal. Um, so this is a great product for someone that's very immunocompromised. Um, they're really struggling with a lot of, lot of stress, uh, just a breakdown of the immune system completely. So again, I just wanted to know if you could take that in order to build your mitochondrial, like if you have a DNA dysfunction mm -hmm. in your yep. mitochondria. Yep. You try to take the N-acetylcysteine and, and those kind of things, and you break out. You know, hmm. you have a, an actual allergic reaction. Is there something else that you can use as a different path to getting your mitochondria back up? If there's a if there's a DNA dysfunction of the mitochondria, that's going to be that I don't know. That's 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 a tough question because if the if the actual right the structure of those mitochondria are wrecked. We'd have to do DNA. Probably not. Hope, yeah, yeah, right. I would say the assumption is, is hope maybe there are some of those mitochondria that are still functioning at some capacity. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be alive. You need mitochondria to produce energy. So maybe it, I'm stretching here, but maybe it, it would have some value with some of those mitochondria that may not be affected. Um, you could you could kind of the the L-carnitine I have separately, the lipoic acid I sell separately. Um, I have to check the N-acetylcysteine, but that's where I'd focus on maybe a few of those. Yeah. Cortisol reduction. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this one either. Let me skip through that. Um, so the main influences of the um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, so this is kind of our, our stress center, our, our glands that kind of control our, our cortisol levels, um, really are impacted the most by um, glycemic dysfunction. So the more that our blood sugar is going up and down, the more our, our cortisol levels are, are fluctuating with that, and that's not a good thing. We, we want to try to keep our cortisol levels they generally just rise right before we wake up in the morning, and then our cortisol levels will they have a nice, what we call circadian rhythm, and they'll drop throughout the day to a point where we can fall asleep at night. Um, the more our, sh our blood sugars are bouncing up and down throughout the day, um, the more havoc that's going to place on the HPA axis. The, the, less our, the less sleep we get, the less quality of sleep we get. That, too, is going to affect our cortisol levels. Um, and then the more inflammation that we have in our body, the more that's going to affect our, our, our cortisol levels as well. 
and then mental and emotional issues. As we get into a stressful situation, our cortisol will generally rise, but we want to make sure that that cortisol falls back down to a normal level. And if it stays up there, you know, that's not going to be a good thing. That ultimately is going to weaken our immune system over time. I'm going to skip over that. Put way too much information in tonight. <laughs> uh, um, so testing and repair. Um, so how do I know if my cortisol level is in the right well, range? Um, do I have enough chronic stress sleep. that I that I need to do something <laughs> about it? We do sell a saliva test kit here. Um, actually, the test kit itself is free. So if you're interested in um, what is my cortisol level, what do I need to do with it, I would recommend there's a four-point test that you can get, and I can go through that with you. Basically, you take the kit home. There's these little tubes that you spit saliva into. In about two weeks, you'll get your cortisol levels back. My wife, Monica, will do the interpretation. And then from there, we could say, okay, yeah, your cortisol is you know, through the roof. Let's t look at ashwagandha. Let's look at some adrenal supports to bring that, that cortisol level down. Um, DHEA and testosterone, we can also test for that as well with actually the same test kit. Um, I'm not going to get into DHEA tonight tremendously, but it does have a very beneficial effect um, in um, autoimmune diseases. So if your DHEA is very low, so what happens, I'll get into this a little bit, but under long periods of stress, your cortisol levels become very high, and what they do is they steal DHEA away from the body to make more cortisol. And so what happens then is we see patients with low DHEA levels have a higher incidence of autoimmune diseases. So we can look at some of these issues like rheumatoid arthritis, I spelled lupus wrong, LUPS, <laughs> uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, MS, uh, Sjogren's. If we increase those patients' DHEA levels, their condition improves dramatically. So that's kind of a neat thing. Um, and then the best thing to do for your adrenal glands is to sleep. If getting good sleep is critical. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over that either. Um, just a bit of information on physical activity in the immune system. So you want to kind of be in this sweet spot. There was a study that was done where I pulled this from, but you just want to make sure that you're not over-exercising and, st and stressing your adrenal glands out. That's not good either. Um, so you just want to get a moderate amount of exercise, get the blood flowing, you know, get the res the, your respiration up. Um, and that's going to give you your best uh, effect on the immune system. If you're going out and running marathons and over-exercising, you're going to tax out your adrenal glands and you're going to weaken your immune system. So just moderate exercise. Don't go crazy with it. <clears throat> uh, there's a study that talked about the benefit of physical activity in the immune system. Um, so the recovery plan. I say so using food as medicine, balancing stress hormones, um, building the immune system reserve, healing your gut. Um, and supporting your liver. And I put some, I think on the handout I have like three or four products for liver function um, since I didn't get a lot into detox tonight. But um, milk thistle is, can be very beneficial. Um, Phytocore is on there. I didn't explain that tonight yet, but Phytocore is basically a, a multi-nutrient. Um, it's got um, like artichoke leaf extract that helps with liver function. Uh, just a different multitude of, of nutrients to help detoxify the, uh, uh, the liver, essentially. And then I think there's a, a core restore kit that I listed on there as well, too. That's a one-week detox program that actually has the phytocore in it. There's a protein drink and a multivitamin. Um, so measles, flu shot, high-dose vitamin C, some of these things that are kind of in the news here and there. Um, <laughs> You know, why is measles on the rise? You know, I think we can debate that all night, too. You know, our, you know, our kids being, you know, their parents afraid of vaccinating their children against measles. Um, you know, what, um, yeah, there are those patients that are infected, they're, you know, what is their diet like? Are they eating high fructose corn syrup for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Um, were they on a lot of antibiotics uh, for ear infections and it decreased their integrity of their GI tract? There's so many other confounding factors involved with that that I don't think that really the mainstream media picks up. And, you know, we never really get that side of the story. We just get this panic of, 
There's 70 cases of measles in California. Oh my gosh, everyone's got to get vaccinated. I, I don't know if that's the right reason or not. All right, so. Do you recommend the vaccination? The measles vaccine? Yes. <laughs> Do I recommend it? No, I don't. <laughs> but I let everyone, you know, make your own choice. But I, I personally don't recommend it. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I obviously when I was a kid, I got it. I didn't. I mean, but um, did, I mean, you probably didn't get. Did you get the? If you might don't mind sharing. Sure Need to already share it. Okay, um, but you know, measles isn't life threatening. It can be, but it is treatable. Just like chicken pox is is treatable. I don't plan on giving my children the chicken pox vaccine. I had chicken pox when I was a kid. Um, there's always risk and benefit to all of these vaccines and, and, you know, questions surrounding that. You know, is your immune system strong enough to mount a response to the vaccine? So the vaccine is, and depending on what vaccine we're talking about, um, you know, your body has to mount uh, these, you know, you have enough energy to create these memory cells from the vaccine so that when it sees the real infection or the real measles the next time around, you have immunity to it already. But sometimes that doesn't always work work that well and then there could be consequences of the vaccine too that I don't want to get into that debate but yeah yes uh, somebody once said uh, for example if you eat candy or something sweet and it takes the protective coating off your mucous membranes right. and you're more susceptible to germs that even at that point just by eating a piece of sweet candy uh, um, it, I would say if you're immune compromised enough I would say that would be true. And I think that plays um, a part of our more, our overall health status. You know, if we're weak, we're tired, we're exhausted, I think that's going to have obviously a more greater effect on that person than somebody that's, you know, younger, their immune system is more flexible, that type of thing. I, I, I do think in general high glycemic or, you know, foods and candies, sweets with a lot of sugar in them, I mean, it's not a wise decision to make over, continually over time, yeah. right? I think every right, once in a while, sure, right? I don't know, we all do. But I, continually over time, that's going to ultimately impact the immune system in a negative uh, fashion. Of course, so. a shot of whiskey to help well, <laughs> that's, that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I get this question a lot. You know, I got the flu shot. Um, now I have the flu. How is this possible? So, and we're not going to just debate all vaccines tonight, but um, again, depending on what flu vaccine we're talking about, um, the injections that that are given not the nasal sprays that is a, what we, um, a a dead vaccine so it's kind of the the virus is already chopped up already and made into small parts and that's literally just injected into your body your immune system doesn't really we trick the immune system it doesn't really know any better and it forms antibodies so that next time it, it sees the real actual virus it knows it's got these white blood cells already to attack that virus and you, you, you still could track the flu, but you don't have symptoms of it. Um, so in, you know, this case here, you know, now I've got the flu, what happened? Well, maybe the strain, uh, of the flu virus that you got was not the strain that was in the vaccine. Maybe your immune system was so weak and your mitochondria didn't have any metabolic reserve that it didn't have enough energy to produce enough antibodies in the first place. So, I mean, so there's all kinds of different arguments surrounding that. So it, it is, it, it's not fair to say that you, you got the flu from the actual shot. I'd say maybe the shot didn't work and, and you just got the flu just on coincidence. Or what, you can make the argument, well, you got the flu vaccine. That puts a stress on your body. Your body has to produce these antibodies. Now, basically, you're, you're giving ourselves a, a pseudo-infection, kind of this false infection. And so... Now we've, we've put another stress on the immune system, and now, lo and behold, we pick up the virus from somewhere else we didn't even know. That, that's going to create that infection for us. Um, do high-dose vitamin C products really work? 
I don't believe in high dose vitamin C. I mean, a basic uh, citrus orange, you know, like a citrus fruit, like an orange clementine, you're going to have about 100 to 200 milligrams of vitamin C. I'm not a huge proponent of high dose vitamin C. I, 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 I haven't been convinced of uh, the research that I've seen that vitamin C is the magical answer. Um, like, um, I don't want to name specific products, but I'm sure we could all think of them. There's a lot of commercials on TV for these products. Um, I'd rather you take vitamin D. I'd rather you get good rest. I'd rather you get rid of all the high fructose corn syrup out of your diet. Um, we didn't talk about iodine tonight, but I'm a huge fan of iodine for different. Those are very popular vitamin C products. That's an ingredient, high fructose corn syrup. That's horrible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's just awful. If you want some vitamin C, I always recommend a half a clementine a day. If you want to get some vitamin C. But hundred to two hundred. In my opinion, yeah. Generally speaking, I'm not a. There's a multitude of other things I'd rather s you see spend your money on, like the probiotics, the fish oils. Take the place of the vitamin C. Yep. Yep. Hands down. Um. I know I skipped over some of those. Do we have time for ten more slides? <laughs> All right, I'll go through this. I'll go through this real <laughs> quick. Um, this is just one. This is a medication that, or uh, a drug that we compound here called naltrexone. Um, the reason I put this in is I just it really I think ties in well with the with a lot of autoimmune disease and just the immune system in general. Um, I'm going to go through some of these pretty quick, but um, naltrexone itself on a high dose um, is used for alcohol dependence, it's a totally, has totally different pharmacokinetics in the body, a totally different pharmacology in the body. Um, at 50 milligrams, if somebody says I'm on naltrexone, they're going to look at you and think, you know, you have an alcohol issue, quite honestly. Um, but the naltrexone that I'm talking about is in the, in the range of 3 to 4 to 5 milligrams per day, not 50 milligrams per day. Um, and so basically what it does is it tricks the body, it attaches to a receptor in the body that is responsible for increasing endorphins in the body. And endorphins are our natural painkiller, but the endorphins also, it's a neuropeptide that uh, boosts the immune system. So it gets the white blood cells ready for infection um, and, and a multitude of other things. Um, so it, endorphins, I should probably just read my own slide here. So it boosts the immune system. Um, it, it directly activates T and B cells, natural killer cells, macrophages, stem cells, so all just kind of different players of the immune system. Um, endorphins are also that natural high, so if you talk about runner's high or exercising, endorphins are these things that just kind of give us this euphoria, um, but they do have a, a very nice effect on the immune system. Um, LDN's possible benefits, there's a lot of research that's out there on LDN. It's a whole list of a lot of autoimmune issues. We, d we compound this for uh, a lot of patients that have Lyme disease. Um, it just, it's, with Lyme disease, there's all these co-infections that are kind of masking and, and muddying the waters, and doctors are using multiple antibiotics for patients with Lyme disease, and it's just hard to separate that out. Um, Lyme disease does a, does a really good job of, again, just um, modulating the immune system in, a, in whatever appropriate way that the immune system thinks it needs to go. So it doesn't overactivate the immune system, uh, it, it just gives it a nice balance. Uh, I talked about this already, but LDN's dosed about one and a half to five milligrams a day. We compound. We can also compound it into a suspension, and then it's actually used um, in autism for different scenarios. And we can actually make it into a topical gel too. So it's kind of a novel. Is there a way. benefit to the gel or the just oil? ease of ease of in, ease of administration for the for the parent to put it on their child? So if you have a real for adults, for adults capsules is the way to is the really? most cost effective way to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Really? Yep. Yep. 
There's almost not a patient with an immune issue that shouldn't be on LDN, in my opinion. Like fibromyalgia. Fibro, fibromyalgia, yeah, absolutely. The, um, it's probably on my next slide. Um, so it takes about six to 12 weeks to experience maximum benefit. So it does take a bit of time for, you, for it to take effect. So some patients do stop it a little bit prematurely. Um, so I always recommend at least taking it for two to three months before you really... And then you from, know, there, from there, no from there indefinitely. indefinitely. Yeah. Or until you, I mean, until you're, whatever that situation you're treating is resolved, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, so Well, right. I mean, it, 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 right. I mean, for Lyme, I mean, patients could be, they may never get rid of Lyme, so you might be on it for a long period of time. I have some patients that are on it for MS or some of these autoimmune issues. They could be on it for years upon years, but it, there's no side effects. There's, well, there's a few that are mentioned here, but it, they're very mild. So if it's compounded, is it requiring that? It does require a prescription, yeah. So I just bring this up because I get a lot, I, I've been recently getting a lot of questions on LDN and, and more, I have patients, I mean, I could tell you, I mean, I don't want to tell these stories like it happens to everyone, but there's patients that have come in here with MS and they're walking with canes and then a month or two later I'm seeing them and they don't need their cane to walk. So for some individuals it does have a very profound effect on their immune system and it just, it's just amazing. I don't, I think we need, patients should be, I mean, I think the community should be, be more aware of this. Well, you know, the, the obviously the doctors that we work with know about it. It's not traditional mainstream medicine by any means, but I think if the more that I could talk about it and promote it, there's going to be more patients out there benefiting from it, especially patients with the autoimmune issues. Yeah. That's where I have recently seen in the last three months, like I said, I've seen some really phenomenal uh, cases of patients. It's prescription. It's prescription only. What yeah. about Hashimoto's, I have a lot, um, a lot of patients that come here that are being, yeah. Again, it's not clearing it up completely, but it's helping their thyroid much more effectively. Um, the only thing with the side effects is it does cause a little bit of insomnia for the first few days, three to five days. I have seen a few patients that that doesn't go away, but, um, you know, again, for the majority of the patients that I've seen, it, it has um, been tolerated very well. Uh, who should not use LDN? Um, so there are small set of patients if you're on um, narcotic pain medication. It's not that you can't take the LDN, but you do want to, um, if, you if you're taking pain medication, uh, narcotic pain medication, you wouldn't want to take it at the exact same time. Uh, you want to space it apart. You definitely would want to work with your doctor and your pharmacist on, on that type of thing. Um, and then caution, so we talked about Hashimoto's. You do want to use, you can still take LDN if you have Hashimoto's, but what's going to happen, or in theory what's going to happen is um, those antibodies are going to go down and your thyroid gland is going to start working more effectively, so your dose of your thyroid is going to have to change because your thyroid is going to start working the way that it should and so that medication you were taking for low thyroid, you're, you're obviously you're, the dose of your thyroid medicine is going to have to go down in theory. But the best way for your thyroid to work is for the, the, it's your own gland to do what it needs to do. So we, somebody just mentioned about fibromyalgia. So there are some studies that are done with fibromyalgia and LDN, even though it's not really an immune issue, but it does help with that. Uh, so there was a nice clinical trial that was done with LDN. Um, and then there's a couple of other studies. There, I just pulled out a few of them, but with Crohn's disease, beneficial effect with, with LDN. I'm not going to go through all the details here, but there's a couple of studies with that. I've seen some amazing cases with MS, um, which is really neat. And there's a lot of the references here that I pulled together. Um, so back to that first picture, right? We got the three-year-old. How are we doing? Time? Um, this is actually my daughter. <laughs> so I wanted to share this. Um, so she got, oh, geez. RSV, like a, a viral infection in her lungs, and then um, on top of that, she got pneumonia, poor thing. Um, so she was at Children's Hospital for a week, but but she pulled through. Um, 
and there's her last week. So she made a full recovery. Um, but, you know, it really taught me about, you know, just as a parent and a very young, you know, you had a 40 pound person there in front of you that their immune systems are very immature. They're, you know, they don't have a lot of immunity built in yet. Um, you know, so there's all the things that were, that I just talked about tonight is pretty much what my, you know, what I'm doing for my own kids. But I think more parents need to know that, you know, get rid of the high fructose corn syrup, get them on a good fish oil, um, you know, all the things that I just talked about, probiotics they take every day, um, you know, a good multivitamin, building up their metabolic reserve. You know, I think all those things played a crucial role, you know, for my daughter um, in being, you know, being here. You know, she, had, she got pretty close to not making it, so I'm very happy that she's here. So, yeah. All right. That's what I got. Hey, Beth, thank you for coming. Sorry, I tried to <laughs> keep it down.